Hello and welcome to episode 5 of Walt Disney Animation Studios Trivia. This week we're returning to the revival era and heading down to the beautiful city of New Orleans because you guessed it, we're covering The Princess and the Frog. Come along for this enchanting journey down the bayou and hopefully learn something new along the way. The Princess and the Frog is the 49th film released by Walt Disney Animation Studios. It premiered in Los Angeles on November 25, 2009, and wide released on December 11th that same year. Just like in our previous Treasure Planet episode, The Princess and the Frog was directed by the duo of John Musker and Ron Clemens. The Princess and the Frog grossed around 104 million domestically and 270 million worldwide, making it a box office success. It had a great opening weekend, raking in over 24 million and making it the highest grossing opening to date for an animated movie in December. The movie went on to be the fifth highest grossing animated film of 2009. The Princess and the Frog was the studio's most successful film since Tarzan, but it didn't quite reach the success levels of the Renaissance era it was largely inspired by. Something to consider is that James Cameron's Avatar came out a week after The Princess and the Frog, and that movie completely overshadowed just about everything else at that time. The Princess and the Frog received three Oscar nominations at the 82nd Academy Awards, one for Best Animated Feature and two for Best Original Song. It ended up losing Best Animated Feature to Pixar's Up and Best Song to Crazy Heart. This was the first time since The Lion King that a Walt Disney Animation Studios movie had two songs up at the same time in the Best Song category. The film was nominated for eight Annie Awards and won three for animation and voice acting. It won Best Screenplay at the African American Film Critics Association Awards and was also nominated for Best Animated Feature at the Golden Globes. The idea for the movie was loosely based on the novel The Frog Princess by E.D. Baker, which is a twist on the well-known fairy tale The Frog Prince from the Brothers Grimm collections. There were said to be a few different versions of the story in the works between Walt Disney Animation Studios and Pixar. When John Lasseter became the head of the Disney Animation Studios, he asked John Musker and Ron Clements to come back to the company. Ron and John had previously directed well-known Disney movies such as The Little Mermaid and Aladdin, but left the studio in 2005. The Princess and the Frog is the project that Lasseter pitched to them for their return, and it evolved from there. Ron and John thought that since the majority of fairy tales are set in Europe, it would be a nice change to do one set in America. New Orleans was chosen due to its enchanting, magical qualities, and also because it was Lasseter's favorite city. Ron and John had never been to the city, and Lasseter told them that they had to go visit before doing any work on the movie. They spent 10 days touring, researching, and experiencing the rich, unique culture of New Orleans, and they were greatly inspired after doing so. Tiana was inspired in part by a woman named Leah Chase who they met in New Orleans. She and her husband have their own restaurant, and like Tiana, she started out as a waitress. She talked to them about her passion for food and how it brings people together, a theme that found its way into the heart of the movie. Well, I'm certainly not princess material. I don't look like a princess. I certainly don't act like a princess. That was amazing what they did with that movie, just with what I told them. And I hope it inspired other little girls. I will forever be grateful for that. Mama Odie was also inspired by a woman they met in their travels, Colleen Sally. She was a teacher and storyteller who showed Ron and John around the city. She consulted with them many times during the making of the film, but sadly she never got to see the final product as she passed away before its release. Tiana is, of course, historic for being the first black Disney princess, but the creators had a lot to learn and navigate throughout the course of making the movie. The project was initially announced as The Frog Princess in July of 2006, and when the first concepts were presented for the movie, there were several criticisms, particularly from African American media outlets. The first issue was with the title. The first Black Disney Princess's movie being called The Frog Princess almost insinuated that she had animalistic or ugly qualities, and that was something the creators wanted to stay far away from. Other issues surfaced with the princess character. Originally named Maddie, some people felt it was too similar to a derogatory term historically used to stereotype black people. This paired with the fact that her original job was a chambermaid was not a good look, and so her name became Tiana and her occupation became a waitress. The New Orleans setting was also questioned due to the city's recent experience being hit by Hurricane Katrina in 2005. This caused devastation in the city, particularly in the black neighborhoods. Large amounts of the black population in the city were either forced to leave or live in poverty, and setting the film there was considered by some to be an offense to the victim's suffering. The Princess and the Frog came out in 2009, but it took over three years to make, and the director's first research trip took place only eight months after Katrina hit. Despite criticisms, the story did not change settings. 
The other part of the movie that received concerns was the inclusion of a black voodoo witch doctor. In the movie, Louisiana voodoo is depicted as magic rather than a religion, but again, this element was kept in the film. The Princess and the Frog marked Walt Disney Animation Studios' short-lived return to traditional animation. The studio hadn't made a hand-drawn feature since Home on the Range in 2004. John Lasseter is considered the father of CGI animation, having been the driving force behind Toy Story and many of Pixar's other beloved films. But his roots are firmly in the world of traditional animation, as that's where he got his start. Lasseter felt that it was time for a return to form for the studio, and after bringing John Musker and Ron Clements back and getting them on board with the Frog Prince fairy tale idea, hand-drawn animation seemed like the best fit for the project. Many animators who had either left or been laid off when Disney decided to stop traditional animation were located and brought back for the making of this movie. There was actually concern that there wouldn't be enough animators' desks for the artists to work at because the studio had been told to sell them off once the jump to computer animation had been made. But Chris Hibbler, grandson of writer and producer Winston Hibbler, who worked at the studio back in Walt's day, revealed that he'd secretly hidden away some of the desks, enough to make the movie with. Since hand-drawn animation hadn't been done by Disney for years, it was pretty difficult to revive. They had to create an entirely new production process starting from the ground up, learning new ways to do things. A lot of digital work still ended up happening on the movie, such as backgrounds being digitally painted and a lot of the architecture in the movie being based off 3D computer models. It was agreed early on that the animation style they were aiming for in the New Orleans scenes was that of Lady and the Tramp, as it was considered the pinnacle of Disney's style. It was also one of the few animated Disney movies set in an American town or city. For the bayou scenes, animators took heavy inspiration from the impressionistic style used in Bambi. What they did in Bambi was they more painted how it feels to be in a forest instead of painting the actual forest, so we painted what it feels like to be in New Orleans. It's been theorized that while The Princess and the Frog was successful, its failure to be an absolute smash hit lessened the chances of any more traditionally animated Disney movies. Winnie the Pooh, released by the studio in 2011, was hand-drawn, but other than that, there have yet to be any other traditionally animated Disney movies. However, there might be hope, because the current head of the studio, Jennifer Lee, has said that it is possible, depending on what styles are driven by filmmakers and what they feel suits future projects. Please. 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 The design for when Tiana and Naveen are frogs used to be a lot more realistic. They even brought in real frogs for reference, but these ideas were ultimately ditched for a much cuter design in order to remove all that is unappealing in frogs. Except for the mucus, of course. It's mucus! The Almost There song sequence utilized an Art Deco graphic style based on the art of Harlem Renaissance painter Aaron Douglas. Let's talk about music. The Princess and the Frog, while marking a return to traditional animation, also brought back the Broadway musical style adopted during the Renaissance. The movie features music written by composer Randy Newman, well known for his work in Pixar. Alan Menken was considered due to his experience with 2D animation and the Broadway style, but John Lasseter wanted to mix it up. Randy Newman was the perfect choice seeing as he's a jazz composer and he has strong ties to the city of New Orleans. His mother is from the city and he grew up spending every summer there. Randy Newman had wanted to sing the opening song he wrote for the movie, Down in New Orleans, but the directors thought that famous New Orleans singer Dr. John should do it. This was in order to keep more of the city's culture present, but also to further differentiate the music from Pixar songs Randy Newman had sung, like the tracks in Toy Story. Most of the musicians hired for the movie were all New Orleans based. There's even a New Orleans gospel choir providing the backing track in the song Dig a Little Deeper. La, la, la. Alicia Keys directly contacted Walt Disney Studios about voicing Tiana when the role was announced, and it was reported that Tyra Banks and Beyonce were also considered for the role, but it ultimately went to Anika Nani Rose. When Anika first heard Disney was making a movie about a black princess, her thoughts were, I have to get that. <laughs> <laughs> That's for me. Um, I literally thought, I have to do that. Ron Clements said that Anika was the second person to audition for the role. Her first audition was right after Dreamgirls premiered in Los Angeles. She says that she left the premiere, didn't go to any after parties, and took her sister-in-law to help her run lines for her audition the next day. There were three finalists for the role of Prince Naveen, and the directors were unsure of who to select, so John Lasseter suggested playing the voices for some of the women around the office. A strong majority was in favor of Bruno Campos' work, landing him the role. 
This is the first movie from the studio where all the voice actors also sing for their characters since Beauty and the Beast in 1991. This wasn't so much intentional as it was a fortunate coincidence, seeing as the directors had no idea that Keith David, who voiced Dr. Facilier, could sing when they cast him. Part of the reason Jim Cummings was cast as Ray is because he's previously lived in New Orleans and spent a lot of time there, so he could do the character's Cajun accent. Ron and John pitched the movie to Oprah Winfrey at Disneyland while she was there filming something for her show. She was hired initially as a technical consultant for the film, but ended up also providing the voice for Tiana's mother in the film, Eudora. Speaking of Eudora, Jennifer Lewis, voice of Mama Odie, first auditioned for the role of Tiana's sweet mother, but she ended up saying, Darling, there's nothing sweet about my voice. Do you have another paw? She has said that she channeled a lot of comedian Moms Mabley into her performance as Mama Odie. Randy Newman, the film's music composer, kept having potential parts in the movie that would get cut. He was supposed to voice a turtle in the song When We're Human that got scrapped, and then an otter he was meant to voice also got cut. They ended up finally finding a little role for him that made it into the finished film, Cousin Randy the Firefly. Hey Cousin Randy, you ready for a little bayou out of call? Ready when you are Cousin Ray. Right. The voice of Marlon the Gator was provided by none other than celebrity chef Emeril. Y'all gonna taste so good, taste it as bad as ah! ah! While not from Louisiana, Emeril is famous for his mastery of Creole and Cajun cuisine. Just bam, 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 bam. Bam. And now it's time for reoccurring Disney voice actors. I typically only list reoccurring voice actors from Walt Disney Animation Studios films here, but I simply cannot resist mentioning that Jennifer Lewis, voice of Mama Odie, is also the voice of Flo in the Pixar franchise Cars. We love Flo. Jim Cummings, voice of Ray, is personally responsible for probably like a quarter of all Disney roles. A slight exaggeration but his roles are so vast that they have to be alphabetized and split into sections on his Disney wiki page, so. Going directly from Walt Disney Animation Studios, his roles include Keikata and Chief Powhatan's singing voices in Pocahontas, Ed the Hyena in The Lion King, as well as part of Scar's singing in the song Be Prepared, Razul and Farouk in Aladdin, Nessus in Hercules along with a couple of residents in Thebes, a sailor from Eric's ship in The Little Mermaid, and his most notable roles, Tigger and Pooh in the 2011 Winnie the Pooh. He's done countless more voices for Disney TV shows and sequels though, and it's a little insane. John Goodman, who voices Big Daddy LaBeouf, also voiced Pacha in The Emperor's New Groove. And yes, he was Sully. We also love Sully. Paul Briggs, typically an animator and storyboard artist, voiced two fingers in the movie. He also voiced Marshmallow in both Frozen movies, as well as Yama in Big Hero 6. Corey Burton, voice of Mr. Harvey Fenner, also voiced Grumpy in Ralph Breaks the Internet, Mole in Atlantis The Lost Empire, one of the ancestors in Mulan, the Titans, the Burnt Man, and the End of the World Man in Hercules, Brutish Guard in The Hunchback of Notre Dame, Onus in Treasure Planet, and Prince Ahmed and the Necklace Merchant in Aladdin. Let's take a look at where the Princess and the Frog has appeared in the Disney parks across the world. Just a quick disclaimer, characters from the movie have appeared in a lot of parades and shows that aren't strictly Princess and the Frog themed, so I won't be listing those here. A live parade and show called Tiana's Showboat Jubilee premiered on October 25th, 2009 at the Magic Kingdom Park in Walt Disney World, and on November 5th that same year at Disneyland California. In Disneyland, the movie characters would board the Mark Twain Riverboat and sing songs from the movie, following a short storyline taking place after the events of the film. This show ran at both parks until January 3rd, 2010. At Disneyland, it was replaced by an event called Princess Tiana's Mardi Gras Celebration, where Tiana, along with dancers and a band, performed songs from the movie. It officially ended October 3rd, 2010, but returned in a limited form during 2011 to 2013. In June 2020, it was announced that the Splash Mountain attractions in Disneyland and Magic Kingdom in Walt Disney World would eventually be rethemed to a Princess and the Frog story. This announcement came amidst the George Floyd protests and the Black Lives Matter movement, and seeing as Splash Mountain is based on characters from the racially problematic Song of the South movie, the announcement tied into that momentum. The song, Dig a Little Deeper, was performed as the finale song for the Mickey and the Magical Map show at the Fantasyland Theater in Disneyland, California. The song is sung by Mama Odie in the movie, but Tiana sang it in the show. The Magical Map ran from 2013 to 2020. It hasn't returned since the COVID-19 pandemic caused the parks to close down. If you take a ride down the rivers of America on the Mark Twain Riverboat in Disneyland, you'll hear the song, Down in New Orleans, as you look out at New Orleans Square from across the water. Other than that, there isn't really any representation for the Princess and the Frog outside of the North American parks. 
While not in the parks, I do need to mention that on the Disney Wonder, which is a ship in the Disney Cruise Line, there is a restaurant called Tiana's Place. It's based off the restaurant in the movie and offers southern food and live jazz music along with some of the film's characters. One of the Disney parks better get a Tiana's Place very soon. Let's finish off the video with some froggy fun facts. The Princess and the Frog was supposed to release on Christmas Day in 2009, but it was changed due to a competing family film being scheduled to release on the same day. Who could this threatening competitor be? Ah yes, Alvin and the Chipmunks, the squeakle. The funny part is, their concern was valid because Alvin and the Chipmunks actually outgrossed the Princess and the Frog. Part of the promotion for The Princess and the Frog included an ad from Geico where Naveen as a frog converses with the company's gecko mascot. In December 2020, Disney announced a television spin-off called Tiana that will be released on Disney Plus in 2022. This show will be one of the first spin-offs of a Walt Disney Animation Studios film to be produced by the studio itself rather than Disney Television Animation. We know that the prologue takes place in 1912 because a streetcar passenger can be seen reading a newspaper with the heading, Wilson Elected, referring to the President Woodrow Wilson. Aladdin's magic carpet can be seen near the beginning of the film as someone shakes it out from their balcony, and there's actually another Aladdin easter egg. During Dig a Little Deeper, one of the items Mama Odie throws away is Genie's lamp. I wonder if Jafar is still in there. Lewis, the jazz-loving crocodile, is of course named after the jazz legend Louis Armstrong. The number on the streetcar Tiana takes to work is labeled as A113. This number can be found hidden in many Pixar movies, as it was the number of the room at CalArts where the animation department studied. Ron Clements, John Musker, John Lasseter, and even Brad Bird studied there. After seeing Lasseter and Bird hiding the number in their own films, John Musker thought, darn it, I'll work it into one of my movies. Anika Nani Rose, voice of Tiana, requested that the character be left-handed because she herself is. This film marks Ron and John's sixth time directing a movie for Walt Disney Animation Studios. They'd previously directed The Great Mouse Detective, The Little Mermaid, Aladdin, Hercules, and Treasure Planet, and would go on to also direct Moana for their seventh collaboration with the studio. Ron and John typically have little cameos in the movies they direct, and this one is no exception. When the Fenner brothers get covered in cake at the party, the animators cleverly placed the cake and frosting in a way that resembled the movie's directors. Considering that Tiana spends a large amount of the film naked, as a frog, she actually has more costume changes than any other Disney princess. At the end of the movie, Tiana's restaurant has a band called Firefly 5 Plus Lou. This is a play on the name Firehouse 5 Plus 2, which was a jazz band formed by members of Disney's animation department back in the 1950s. Two of the members of the legendary group of animators, the Nine Old Men, were in the band, Frank Thomas and Ward Kimball. We see that Tiana has a picture of her father where he's dressed in a military uniform. Hanging off his picture frame is the Distinguished Service Cross, the second highest award given for heroism in the US Army. These two clues put together imply that Tiana's father died as a soldier while performing an extraordinary heroic act. The women surrounding Naveen when he first shows up and plays music are all caricatures of women who worked at the studio. A lot of the Bayou background sounds are authentic recordings right from Louisiana. A lot of the sounds in the New Orleans setting are also authentic, such as the streetcars. Lewis has a very Madame Mim moment when he first meets Tiana and Naveen. When Dr. Facilier shows up to Lawrence in the gazebo, his presence causes the bubbles to leave the glass of champagne. The name Facilier came from the French word for easy. It suits the character because his whole thing is luring people in with the promise of their dreams coming true with little to no effort on their part. It's the exact opposite of Tiana's work hard and earn what you get mentality. There's a moment in the song Friends on the Other Side that is a homage to Bert and the Penguins in Mary Poppins. The director stated that the design of the water after Tiana and Naveen escape the frog catchers is meant to be a homage to the Hayao Miyazaki style of animation. At the Mardi Gras parade, there are floats that reference some of Ron and John's Disney movies. There's a mermaid float for The Little Mermaid, an Arabian float for Aladdin, and a pirate float for Treasure Planet. The animator of Charlotte originally had her putting on mascara the wrong way, so once he was informed of this, it had to be corrected at the last minute. The name of Ray's love, the evening star Evangeline, came from a poem entitled Evangeline, a tale of Acadie. In this poem, an Acadian girl named Evangeline searches for her long lost love, Gabriel. In the movie, they switched the roles so that it's Ray who's trying to get to Evangeline. In an earlier version of the story, Lewis was a human who couldn't play any instruments, but he desperately wanted to, so he went to Dr. Facilier who gave him the ability to play the trumpet. The kicker was, he also turned him into an alligator. The backstory ended up becoming too complicated, so it was cut from the film. In the movie's end credits, a reference to Disneyland's Pirates of the Caribbean attraction can be seen.
And that brings us to the end. I hope you enjoyed this video and learned a few new things about The Princess and the Frog. It's certainly an important and distinct entry in the Disney animated canon. I've always generally liked the movie, but I tend to grow a bit fonder of the movies I cover in this series, so I feel a deeper appreciation for it now, that's for sure. What are your thoughts on The Princess and the Frog? Let me know in the comments down below. If you like Disney animation and trivia, head over to the Trove to find more videos just like this one. I also have a ranked series and a few video essays over there, and the playlists are linked in the description down below. Consider liking or subscribing if you enjoyed this content, and thanks again for joining us on our visit to the beautiful sights of New Orleans and the Louisiana Bayou. See you next time.